Hello, this is Botany and Plant Sciences course 031, Spring Wildflowers. This is uh, the first class of the eighth week of the course, so it's lecture one, week eight, corresponding to Monday, May the 18th of year 2020. Today we're going to start seeing a very interesting family, uh, the Asteraceae, the sunflower family that used to be called, and we'll see in a second why, the Compositae or compound uh, family, uh, or composites also in English, the composite family, compound family, Compositae, now in modern taxonomy is known as the Asteraceae. And uh, let me start uh, sharing the screen to show you some of the traits that make the Asteraceae actually Asteraceae. Once you learn them, they're very, very distinctive traits. This is an incredibly widespread family. It's all over the world. It has hundreds of thousands of, uh, of uh, sorry, tens of thousands of uh, species. It's in all continents and it's in almost any climate you can imagine. Uh, the trait of the Asteraceae, what links them all, there are a number of things that link them all, but uh, what actually links them all most is the inflorescence. Remember when we learned inflorescences, we talked about heads, inflorescences in heads. And uh, this corresponds to this family alone, the Asteraceae. Uh, if you look at a plant in the family Asteraceae from above, when it's given flower, the quote unquote flower that is not a flower, it's really a head or a composite flower, will look like something like this that you see in figure eight. You will see a lot of um, petal-like uh, structures radiating away from the central disc of the inflorescence. And then in the center, if you look at it, you will see little uh, structures that don't look at all like uh, uh, stamens or, or carpels or pistils. Um, they're, they're really completely different. It's, it's a disc of very clustered structures that we're gonna see in a second in more detail. Uh, very often surrounded by, by, by a, a radius of structures that look like petals. As I will show you in a second, they are really not petals. If you cut longitudinally the flower, and we will do that in class, we will do some cutting of, of sunflowers, uh, what, what you will see is that all this structure is supported by a receptacle that we call the disc. And uh, really, I was wrong in using the word receptacle. It's a, it's a compound receptacle. It's really an enlarging of the stem. Uh, so it's not a receptacle as in one single flower, but it's really a disc, an enlarged part of the stem uh, that supports myriad little flowers. So each one of these things that you see inside, each one is in itself, uh, minuscule uh, and almost microscopic little flower. You can see that the disc is uh, really a transformed stem because it has, as it should have for any stem, uh, leaves and uh, axillary buds and, and uh, a succession of nodes and internodes in, in very reduced uh, bracts, often reduced bracts, sometimes they're quite big, that form the base of the, of the disc. These bracts are known as filaries. The filaries are really the structure that protects the, the flower of the disc. And it plays a role quite similar to the sepals in a normal flower. But this is a compound flower, this is an inflorescence. So it has transformed bracts or leaves that, that protect the whole inflorescence and those are filaries. Filaries, by the way, and we'll see it later, is when you eat when you eat uh, an artichoke, but we'll talk about later when we look at specific plants. If you remove any one of these seeds, uh, of these uh, flowers, really, they're called florets, what you will see is what we have here under 
uh, the label C. You will see uh, a structure here that is really the pistil uh, or the ovary. It's an inferior ovary because all the other parts are attached above it. So it has an inferior ovary with a sort of crown of hairs or, or feathery structures known as the pappus. And we'll talk about later the role that the pappus plays. And then you will see a corolla tube uh, formed by five fused petals. So it has five fused petals. And then if you look inside, you will see a set of anthers inside that are co-joined to each other. They are, they are um, uh, fused uh, to each other. And then in the center of the anthers, what you have is a style coming out with a bifid stigma, a stigma that divides into two parts. This is a typical florid of the Asteraceae that you will find here in the central part in, in the disc. Now, the florets in the edge have evolved to play the same role that petals play in, in a normal flower. Uh, the, the florets in the, uh, in the edge will have the, the, the same uh, inferior ovary. Very often they are uh, sterile, they're not fertile, but they will have the ovary. They will have the corolla, but the corolla, instead of being radiate and actinomorphic like, uh, like the central florets, they have, they're elongated on one side, they're uh, sigomorphic, and they, they make this long petal-like uh, structure that is known as a ligula. And uh, so the flowers, the flowers or the florets and the edge are ligulate. They have a very, very long co elongated corolla. They're sigomorphic and uh, they might have the anthers and the bifid uh, stigma and the style, but very often they are unfertile. They just play a role of attracting an insect. So it's quite interesting, really, when, uh, when you, you think about it. Uh, the Asteraceae are a family that in evolutionary terms, at one point, they, they evolved almost microscopic wind-pollinated flowers. And then at some point, they, quote unquote, decided there was natural selection in favor of larger flowers. And they did something that happens very often in evolution. Instead of going back the way they had come, they kept on going by making the flowers even smaller, but joining them together in inflorescences. So here we have an inflorescence that actually simulates a flower, which is what makes the Asteraceae so fascinating. Everybody will call uh, the Asteraceae a flower when actually what you're seeing is an inflorescence. Um, you know, the quote unquote flower of the sunflower or the daisy, people will call the daisy a flower. It is not really a flower, it is an inflorescence. And the same with the sunflower and many others. Let us look at this illustration of the sunflower where you can see very well what I'm talking about. Before, let us start first here, before the flower, the inflorescence, sorry, the head opens, you see it's protected by these bracts that are really very reduced leaves. You can see the illustration here. You have a stem with leaves and then uh, the inflorescence is really a short shoot with very, very reduced leaves that fall in bracts. And inside of that, you have the disc forming. Once the disc is fully formed, it will open. Uh, the stem will, will open and it will show all the florets to pollinators. The lateral flowers, uh, the ones on the edge, will be forming the yellow, quote unquote, petals of a, of a sunflower. And the internal ones are actually the functional ones that give, will give viable seed. Once the seed or the, the florets are fertilized, the inferior ovary will evolve and develop, sorry, will, will develop into an akeem, uh, which is inside uh, the seed, you have uh, the, the, the ovary, which is actually, it's a one seeded ovary that forms a seed. And outside you have the pericarp, uh, which uh, um, 
is, is, is really like, like a nut. They're really microscopic or very, very small nuts. The, remember the definition when we studied fruits of the achenes? An achene is really a nut of very reduced size. So you have here in the illustration the, the florets, and here uh, the edge florid, which in this case a radial uh, florid or the ligulate florid, which in this case is uh, sterile, it's not fertile, and it only plays a role of attracting pollinators and highlighting the presence of a flower. This is a more schematic uh, diagram of, of the sunflower. Uh, you see the disc or receptacle, uh, you see um, the fillaries on the side, uh, you see the florets in the center with the inferior ovary, the pappus, the um, uh, petals, the anthers coming out, five anthers fused around the style and the bifid style coming out in the middle of the anthers. And of course, in the edge, you have ligulate flowers uh, that uh, actually are zygomorphic instead of being acting monomorphic and they produce a very long um, petal-like uh, structure. Uh, if we look in detail at the small flowers or also known as florets, uh, you will see that the disc florets, the ones that are not in the edge, um, are, have of course an inferior ovary as, you will, as, as I explained have this structure here known as a pappus, which is a, a set of hairs. And then they have the corolla, normally formed by five petals in a disc flower, a set of five fused uh, anthers, and the bilobed stigma coming out, um, supported uh, by the style in the middle of the anthers. It doesn't take a lot to realize that all the worlds of a typical flower are present here. You have an inferior ovary, you have sepals, uh, which are really the pappus. The pappus is uh, modified uh, sepals or a modified calyx. And then you have a corolla formed by five petals. And then of course you have the stamens and uh, in the center, the style and the bifid stigma. In the ray flower, you have exactly the same. You have an inferior ovary, a uh, pappus formed by uh, modified uh, uh, sepals. Then you have the corolla with the ligule, the sigomorphic corolla. And then you have the anthers, the, the, the joint uh, fused anthers and uh, the style with a bilobed stigma. So let me summarize uh, at this point before we start seeing some of the plants in the family. Uh, really recognizing composites Asteraceae, it's very, very easy. Uh, just look at what looks like a flower and you will realize very rapidly that it's really a highly compact, uh, immensely uh, transformed and, and very, very evolved inflorescence where minuscule microscopic flowers play the role of, get together to play the role of a single flower. Of course, the, the um, symbol, uh, I would say the flagship species of the family is, is the sunflower, Elianthus annus. This is a very interesting plant. Uh, it was, um, it's originally from North America. You know, what is now the continental territory of the United States cannot really um, um, have or doesn't really have a lot of uh, um, plants that form part of a global heritage of, of important crops. Rice is from Southeast Asia and China, uh, millet is from Africa, uh, wheat um, and uh, oats and barley are from the Middle East, corn is from Mexico, uh, potatoes are from Peru, but the biggest legacy of the United States to global our, uh, our, um, agriculture is a sunflower. You will still see, and it's, for me it's very exciting to see it, uh, when you go out um, from Riverside, any of the, you take any of the highways up into the mountains and you will see 
at the lower altitude, the wild sunflower all over the place. You will see it also in Riverside, both in our botanical gardens and very near campus in, in, um, in Sycamore Canyon. It's actually full of wild sunflowers. Uh, centuries ago, the, the Native Americans, the First Nations, uh, people learned to cultivate the sunflower and, uh, and use the seed for food and uh, for, for cooking and for a number of, of objectives. And we'll talk about that in, in a second. It's a fascinating plant with all the flowers turning towards the sun. Uh, it's a little bit of an enigma why they do that. Uh, apparently it's mostly a way of advertising uh, to insects. They, they are pollinated by insects and they depend heavily on insects for successful pollination. So in a sunflower, if you look at a head of a, of a cultivated or a wild sunflower, we will see exactly the structure I was uh, talking uh, a little while ago. You will see the disc or also known as a receptacle. You will see outside the disc uh, the transformed bracts or leaves known as fillaries. You will see the flowers sitting on the disc. In, the, in this uh, species, the unripe, the uh, forming flowers, the ovary is um, white. In many species, when it ripens, it turns uh, um, yellow or streaked in color. Uh, you will see the ray flowers with a very thin ovary because they're sterile. Uh, and in the, in the disc flowers, uh, you will see the, um, here you will see the bristles of the papus, the papus and the sunflower is bristly. You can see it down here much better. You can see the bristles of the papus. And uh, then you're going to see the petals. In this case, the petals turn purple, deep purple as, as, uh, as, as you go up, as they ripen. And then you can see a circle of anthers coming out. And in the middle of the circle of anthers, the bifid stigma coming out. So the sunflower head is a typical head of the Asteraceae with ligulate flowers in the edge and uh, disc flowers in the center. That is the most common architecture. If you look at the flowers themselves, uh, you will see here the typical structure of a flower. You will see the inferior ovary, the corolla tube. Uh, you will see uh, so very visible in this image, but you will see with some imagination the, ah, here you can see them, the, the um, um, the bristles of the papus, then you can see the corolla tube, and uh, then the anther tube, all the anthers uh, uh, sticking together, and, uh, and then the stigmas coming out. There is always, besides each flower, there's always a bract that is known by farmers as the chaff. And uh, the, the chaff is basically a reminder that actually the, this is an inflorescence and each flower is supported by an axillary bract. Uh, the, the chaff plays no role whatsoever. It's just a memory like uh, the appendix in human beings that plays no role in digestion. It's just a memory of our lineage. So we come from a lineage of, of, uh, of uh, mammals that used to have a cecum to digest cellulose. We've lost it. We've lost the ability to digest cellulose but we have a very little appendix in our anatomy. The same thing with uh, disc flowers and the ray flowers of the Asteraceae. Each florid is subtended, is supported by a bract. Um, if you look at the fruits forming, you will see here just the once they've been fertilized, the ray uh, flowers have uh, dried and are lost. And you can see here uh, the achenes being formed. This one is already ripe and it, uh, it has become dark in color. The corolla is, is uh, uh, falling, falling off together with the stamens and uh, the, the style and the stigma. And eventually what remains is uh, the inferior ovary fertilized forming an achene. And very often also the um, bristly or papery uh, remainder of the of the papus. So in the in the um, uh, final 
uh, product, what you have is the, the seed very often with a small attached pappus. In the case of the sunflower, the pappus is very small and it eventually falls. And it gives us a typical achenes that uh, you see here. Uh, in, in many sunflowers, they are streaked. They form these, these very characteristic streaks. Although there are varieties of sunflower where the pappus is, is completely black or, or in different uh, uh, colors. Okay, now, not all Asteraceae are exactly like the sunflower with ray florets and disc florets. There are some plants in the family that do not have ray florets, that only have disc florets and they don't have these, these petal looking attractants on the edge. And those are known as discoid heads. Um, and the discoid heads are much smaller, very common in, in wild uh, uh, plants in the family Asteraceae. And you will see, apart from that, the same, exactly the same structure. You will see a disc, you will see the fillaries, uh, you will see uh, the, um, uh, the five fused uh, petals, in this case, opening a little bit more than, than in, say, the sunflower, because these uh, uh, Actinomorphic petals are really the only attractant the flower has. And you can see also the anthers. In this case, uh, the anthers are in dark color, not yellow or almost purple, and, and the stigmas coming out. If you look at a single flower, uh, you will see the inferior ovary and the pappus. The pappus are a um, cluster of bristles uh, surrounding uh, the, the corolla, the anthers, and the sexual parts. Uh, and in many of these um, uh, Asteraceae, not all of them are dispersed by animals. Sunflowers are dispersed by, by seed-eating animals. They're, they're dispersed by granivores. They pay for the dispersal by feeding granivores that will take them sometimes long distances and make uh, storage caches uh, and very often forgetting about them. Many, many Asteraceae are dispersed by wind. And the pappus is what becomes a feathery structure, a plumose structure that uh, helps the pappus be, this helps the, the akin uh, be dispersed. Very often, like in the dandelion, uh, the plants that are wind dispersed, the disc will dry on the outside and curve outside and, uh, do, and offer the seed to the wind and eventually become dispersed with a, with a pappus adapted for wind dispersal. For example, the common dandelion does that. But before we talk about, again, about wind dispersal, uh, let me give you the, the third case. So we talked about plants like the sunflower uh, with a disc and ligulid head. Uh, we talked about plants with an entirely discoid head, lacking li ligulid uh, flowers or petaloid uh, flowers. Uh, the dandelion is on the other side. In, in the dandelion, all florets are petaloid. All of them are petaloid. So it has like this profusion of petals coming out from, from uh, the flowers. They're not really petals. They're petal-like structures or ligulid uh, flowers. So all the flowers are ligulid. And the plants that do have that, we call them ligulid heads. Uh, in the ligulid head, as opposed to in the discoid head, you have, again, the fillaries, the disc, and all the flowers are ligulid, are ray flowers. Uh, the ones, very often the ones outside have longer ligulus than the ones inside, but they're all ligulid. And so if you look at the flowers, you will see Again, the inferior ovary, the pappus forming. Uh, you will see the corolla that has a sigomorphic limb. Then you will see the fused anthers forming the anther tube. The base of the anthers um, uh, has three filaments, so you can see that it does have five fused anthers. And then um, as the style comes out, um, it, it develops two stigmas that, that attract uh, the pollen from visiting insects from other, other flowers. Um, 
very often they have the the style has a thing called a pollen brush so as it is coming out growing inside the anther tube it's brushing the pollen and comes out full of pollen to exchange pollen with a uh, with the next uh, visitor uh, and as i was telling you in the dandelion like in many other plants the the um, the receptacle will eventually, as, it, as the flower becomes fertilized and dries off, the receptacle will shrink in on the on the fillery side of the receptacle and it starts turning around on itself until all the um, achenes with their developed pappus, you see in the dandelion, the pappus is very developed to make a really nice feathery structure, are sort of offering themselves outside to the wind um, in order to be dispersed by the wind. Uh, this is described in this, um, uh, in this um, uh, illustration. Uh, you will see all the florets, only a few are described here, but all the florets are ligulate um, in, the, in the flowering um, dandelion. Then once it's been fertilized, the seeds start to develop and the corollas are lost uh, and then eventually when it's completely ripe the disc starts shrinking drying on the outside and expanding on the inside and it opens to form this this type of structure and all the seeds attached to their plumose pappus that has grown after fertilization become ready to be dispersed by the wind okay um I think I'll stop uh, here in order to continue in, uh, in the next class. Um, so let me go back here. These are the basic traits of, um, of a family. Um, the compound or composite inflorescence forming a head, the existence of uh, ligulate and uh, radiate, uh, or, sorry, ligulate and discoid uh, florets in different proportions. So you have everything from completely discoid flowers to completely ligulate flowers uh, to flowers with both dis discoid and uh, to inflorescences, heads, with both discoid and, uh, and ligulate uh, flowers attached to it. Um, the the Dispersal in the Asteraceae is more often than not, it's wind dispersed, but some produce uh, seeds that are large enough to attract granivores, and those normally do not have uh, papuses and do not uh, uh, disperse by wind. They, they're only dispersed by seed-eating animals like, uh, for example, quail or uh, a number of uh, uh, birds or ants. Ants are, are very, very good dispersers of, uh, of uh, achenes in the, in the composites and the, in the asteration. One interesting final anecdote that I think is quite fascinating, the asteraceae is basically a herbaceous family. It doesn't have any trees. There are no, you, you will never see a tree producing a flower that looks like a daisy. Um, and the family evolved from small herbaceous plants and it has kept in evolution that trait, with one exception. Uh, the, some, some of the Pacific Islands, like for example, the Galapagos or Hawaii or other Pacific Islands have tree composites, tree asteraceae. And that is basically because the first ones to colonize the islands uh, were asteraceae because of flowers, uh, their seed, traveled so well with seed-eating birds or in the wind. And then once they became established, uh, they found an empty niche. There were no other trees. And so they evolved de novo from, from scratch, the ability to produce secondary growth and, and, uh, and uh, grow into a tree form. It's quite fascinating if you visit the forest in the Galapagos to find big trees that if you look at them in detail, they, they will have daisy flowers, uh, because normally we, in, in, in any other continental ecosystem, the United States or Europe or Asia or Australia, you name it, um, there are no trees with daisy flowers. 
only in the Pacific Islands. And there's a really interesting example of adaptation of organisms that have colonized uh, empty environments and have filled empty ecological niches. So we'll stop here. Next week, we're going to see some of the economic botany and some of the most common plants in the family in California. Um, I thank you very much. And next talk will be Wednesday, the 20th uh, of, of May. Thank you very much. And see you next Wednesday.